Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our service today and to those joining us online. A special welcome today to those who might be visiting with us or to any of you who are with us for the first time. My name is Beverly Brown and I'm one of the deacons here at Bedford Baptist. Our lead pastor, Scott, is away today. As many of you know, Scott is on vacation this week visiting New York City uh, with his mom and his daughter, Emily. And he sent a few pictures and it looks like they're having a great time. Uh, today, Scott is attending a church in New Jersey, which he and Derek have been following online. And he's having the opportunity to have lunch today with the pastors from that church. So we wish him continued enjoyment of his vacation and pray that he's safely returned home to us and to Dee and Owen, who've been holding down the fort without him. Uh, Pastor Derek will be preaching this morning, and we look forward to what God has to say to him uh, today, uh, or say to us through him today. And now, please join us as Noam leads us in worship through song. Good morning, church. Welcome. I hope everyone's eyes are okay after the eclipse this week. I know that I did look, but with glasses. Um, so the songs today, we're going to be um, thinking about discipleship and following Jesus. And the first song might be new to some people, but it's, uh, there's a lot of repetition, and the, the message is quite biblical, just about following um, Christ and loving the people he loves and serving the way he serves. So I'll just uh, invite you to stand or sit and, um, and sing together. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow.
Samaros are uh, looking for some goods. Now, you're one, some of you that don't know the situation may not even know who they are. Back in 2016, uh, well, actually before that, our church and Faith Baptist got together and decided that they would support a family, a refugee family. And so these were the uh, refugees that were uh, that were that we ended up supporting. And uh, they've done quite well here. Uh, there's seven of them. There's Patrick and Aisha, that would be the couple. And then there's uh, Musa, who is taking uh, criminology, I believe, in uh, at St. Mary's. Uh, uh, 
Fanta is the next one, and I can't remember what she's doing, but she's she's being educated as well and, and working a part-time job. Then there's Tony, who's about 16, and uh, uh, he's all boy, I tell you that. <laughs> and and then there's the two little girls, Fanta or uh, Miriam and Martina, and uh, the youngest was two years old when they came here. So they're. What they're doing is they're uh, packing a container to, uh, to go to Africa. And they're trying to put uh, a lot of things in it and take it over there to support uh, their family. Uh, they are actually going over themselves in uh, the end of June uh, for a month or maybe two months. And then they're going to be visiting family and uh, so this is, this is a, an opportunity for them to take stuff with them. As you know, a lot of us have a lot of surplus, so whether we're do, doing a little cleanup or we open up a drawer and find a bunch of junk in there that you know, we'd like to get rid of, whether it be, uh, there's a long list anyway, but I mean, it might, it might be an old phone that we think is, is useless. I'm just gonna tell this quick story before I finish. The other day, she's not even here, but uh, Janelle, Janelle, uh, I went over to the apartment that she rents from us, and and uh, and she, she came out and she says, "Here's a phone for the Samaros," and I, and I'm going, "What? You know what are you talking about?" And uh, she says, "Well, you're the contact person, aren't you, for the church, just to give it?" And I, it had completely slipped my mind. So anyway, I took this phone and and uh, and I and Patrick happened to come over the next day, and, and I gave it to him. And if I'd have given him a million bucks, I don't think he'd have been any happier. He, he just, so anyway, a couple minutes later, I talked to him, and he's still got this phone in his hand, and he, he's smiling from ear to ear. And I'm saying, he says, this phone is fantastic. He says, this one's so good. He says, I'm going to give it to my mother. And so, you know, it just goes to show how little things can make, make people, uh, light people's lives up. All right. From there, I'm going to switch to uh, say in the prayer. I hope everybody knows who I am, by the way. My, <laughs> I'm kind of doing things backwards, but I'm getting them done. Um, my name is Stephen Rand, and I'm one of the deacons here. I just came on this year after being off for a year or two. So um, anyway, welcome to everybody. This morning, I'm going to start off by... Uh, by reading Psalm uh, 136. Uh, so let us pray. Give us thanks, O Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, to him who alone does great thing, great wonders who by his understanding made the heavens, who has spread out the earth upon the waters, who made the great lights, the sun to govern the day, the moon and stars to govern the night. We come to you this morning praising you for the world we, li we live in. I realize that not everyone feels this way, so uh, I ask you that to help those that are grieving in some way. This can be a hard building for us to come into sometimes and to present ourselves to you, O oh Lord. We know there are people that are mad at you because their prayers have not been answered in the ways that they wanted. Please let us remember that it's your will be done and not ours. We think now of those who have gone through loss of a loved one, especially those whose lives have been cut short. Now soften, the, please soften the blow. We pray for the ailing and ask to be with them through the process and for those that are supporting them. Not only, we not only think of family and friends, but support for home care and the medical system. We ask, O oh Lord, to bless our 
church staff. We think of Derek this morning as he delivers your message to us. We pray that pa pa Pastor Scott, Emily, and, her, and his mom will have a great trip, and that Dee and Owen will manage to survive without him. Please remember Leanne as well. May we all be refreshed. May they all be refreshed by the break. As plan planning is starting for the summer programs and into the fall, may we ask that you move people to volunteer to help. May you also be with those that are doing the planning. As we listen and watch world news, we pray for all the people involved in the world, the world conflicts. Issues are not as cut and dried as they may seem to us or to them. As ruler of the universe, please grant the peacemakers the wisdom and conveyance of words so the people in charge will see that peace may be achieved through you. As the weather changes and spring and summer become a reality, we pray that the weather will be more favorable this year and more balanced than last. We, will, we also need to remember, that the remember the environment and to help to do our part to save this earth that you have given us to look after. As written in your word, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Please forgive us for all the sins that we commit. We thank you for sending the only sinless one to bear our sins on the cross. As I finish this prayer, pre pre please remind us to keep the lines of communication open with you and always remember that it be your that your will be done, not ours. We also need to remember that that we just don't talk to you, Lord, we need to listen. All these things, Lord, we ask in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. forgot for a, a split moment that it was my time to go up, so I <laughs> had to rush a bit. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll introduce myself more in a few minutes, but for now, I'll invite Leanne to lead us in the doxology and an usher to bring the offering plate forward, and then I'll give thanks.
Lord, we ask your blessing on the tithes and the offerings, and we trust that you are good and that you are um, Lord and that you are at work in this church. So we give all that we have brought to you and we entrust you in your care and ask for your stewardship to guide us and the planning and decisions uh, that are made. For your kingdom and your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now going to invite Wally Graham to come up and lead us in a song when answers aren't enough. I'd love to lead you in this song, but I don't think you know the words. the mountain of desperation you have climbed you have fought you have won but the valley that lies coldly before you casts a shadow you cannot overcome and just when you thought you had it all together you knew every verse to get you through but this time all the sorrow broke more than just your heart and reciting all those verses just won't do when answers aren't enough there is than just an answer to your prayer and your heart will find a safe and peaceful refuge when answers aren't enough he is there instead of asking why did it happen Think of where it can lead you from here. And as your path is slowly easing, that's pain, is slowly easing, you can find a greater reason to live your life triumphant through the years. When answers aren't enough, there is Jesus. He's more than just an answer to your prayer. And your heart will find a safe and peaceful refuge. When answers aren't enough, he is there. Aren't enough there is Jesus he is more than just an answer to your prayer and your heart will find a safe and peaceful refuge answers aren't enough when answers aren't enough when answers are
thank you, Wally, for that wonderful piece and lots of um, powerful truth for us to ponder on. Um, just before I invite Wendy to come up and read the scripture for us, I'll invite any kiddos who are among us this morning uh, to head down the hallway with uh, Carolyn and Julie, who are making their way now. Good morning. The scripture is uh, found in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 29 to 42. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him, and I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas which when translated is Peter. And God will add his blessing to this reading from his holy word. Good morning once again, everyone. Um, if you didn't catch that, my name is Derek. I'm the youth pastor here. As is mentioned, uh, Scott is our lead pastor is on vacation this week. Um, him and mother and, and daughter drove up to New York, something that I don't think I could ever do, so kudos to them for that. Um, I believe this morning they're at, yeah, Renaissance Church, which is a church in New Jersey that Scott and I have been watching and following along some of um, how, they, how they do their Sunday morning worship and learning some uh, tricks about preaching. And of course, as I believe Stephen mentioned, they're going for lunch after, so I'm, I'm quite uh, curious to hear how, how that experience goes, because we've definitely learned a lot from them. Uh, just, uh, I just want to make one announcement before, I, before we jump into the message together. Um, there is a team of, of us from youth group that are heading up to Moncton uh, May 31st to June 1st, just one night, to one conference, which some of you may have heard of it, some of you may not, that's okay. Uh, I went last year for my first time, it was a lot of fun. There was just a small group of us who went this year. I believe there's going to be a few more. Um, and with a few more people comes a few more finances. Um, so we are hoping to help ease kind of the financial burden so that we can, you know, people who it might be a little more challenging for them to come, that we can help alleviate that challenge. So that being said, we're going to do a fundraiser on May 10th, which is a Friday night. Um, there's no scheduling conflicts with anything else. So from 5 to 7 p.m., down in the gym, we're going to have a spaghetti dinner, which will be um, put on by our team that is going. I've also recruited uh, my father, who some of you may have heard has been sharpening his accordion skills. So him and his band will be down there to provide us with some live music. So 
May 10th, 5 to 7 p.m. in the gym, spaghetti, live music. It will be by donation, so give as much or as little as you want if you don't have anything to give and want some spaghetti and a good time. Uh, by all means, come on out. But yeah, all proceeds will be going towards the youth and, and this trip to help uh, make it a little more financial, financially reasonable for those of us attending. Before we jump into the message this morning, let, let's begin with a time of prayer. Father God, we come to you this morning with whatever may be on our hearts and our minds, and we, we give it to you, and we trust that you are here and moving among us, and that you deeply hear and care for the things that may be weighing us down. We pray, God, that again you meet us where we are at and you help us to hear clearly your word given to us. Speak through me and, and the words that uh, you've helped me to prepare. I pray that the truth of your love and your goodness would be made known this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been talking, I feel, the last couple of months, especially leading up to Easter, we've been talking a lot about um, discipleship. We've, Pastor Scott's led us through this series of um, Jesus' journey towards the cross, and we've been looking at different lessons in the Gospel of Luke of, of what this discipleship is that he calls us to, what does it mean, and, and what does it cost? And I kind of want to somewhat continue on this theme of discipleship this week. Um, but kind of looking at the, the how of discipleship. It can be easy for us to get caught up in following the latest cultural trends or innovative church uh, technique and growth strategies, some of which are, you know, there's lots of great stuff out there. But the Bible is still our primary resource for how we go about disciple making. And so that's where we're going to park this morning in those passages that Wendy read for us. And as I began kind of going over this passage and I was looking for the, the how-to, the, the practical side of discipleship, I realized that this passage that she read for us, at least 50%, probably a little bit more of this passage, isn't so much dealing with the practicalities of discipleship, but it, it's still looking at the, the what and the who kind of the core meatiness of discipleship. So before we jump into the practicality aspect, um, I want to, again, talk about, you know, what the what and the who is it that we're talking about here. So, yeah, this is important, and uh, let me explain why. So... When I went to university, um, I, I, well, I did two degrees, and the first degree I did at Mount St. Vincent, and I was in it largely because it was the thing to do out of high school. You go to university and get a degree. I was interested in the things I studied, but wasn't um, particularly, you know, it wasn't something I was driven by. So I passed, I got through, but if, when I look back at the, my grades compared to my first degree when I, I studied because I, I had to versus my second degree where it was something I was very passionate about, there was um, a noticeable difference there. In the passage that Wendy read for us, we see that John the Baptist, as he's preparing the way for Jesus, he, when he first sees him, he, he says, look, the Lamb of God. And this may be a term to us that is um, familiar. Some of us may have heard it a lot. It's quite common in the New Testament and also prevalent in the Old. Others of us may say, well, I have no idea you know, what, what this means. I've never heard it before. But either way, I think it's uh, important for us to take a pause and to understand and to unpack a little bit about what uh, John is saying here when he says, look, the Lamb of God. For centuries in ancient Israel, the prophets spoke of a day when God would come and free his people from the oppression of the surrounding nations. 
They were promised and they had hope and they waited for many years that one day their sufferings would be alleviated, that God would come to his people and free them. While in exile, the Israelites put the blood of a slain lamb on their doorposts as a sign for the angel of death to pass over their home. Hence, if you're familiar with um, the festival term Passover, this is where it comes from. Lambs were also used as daily sacrifices in the temple to cover up people's sins. And in the Maccabean era, the lamb was seen as a symbol of a great conqueror. So Jesus came as the Lamb of God to free his people from captivity, to be a permanent cover for their sins, and to be the conqueror of death itself. So when John is saying, look, the Lamb of God, I think we need to have this picture, this image in our minds, that it's not a random phrase that seems to have no relevance and it's just kind of in our Bibles, but there is a lot going on there. This person that has been waited for for many years has finally arrived, and John recognizes that. Then John says this, I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. In those days, in the, in the kind of Old Testament days of the Bible, it occurred that, it only occurred that God would send his Spirit, you know, in a particular time and place and for a short period of time. So for John to suggest that the Spirit would come on, on Jesus as a dove and remain on him was something that had never happened before. This was something revolutionary. When the two disciples heard John say, look, the Lamb of God, they needed no convincing. They knew exactly who it was that had arrived, and they immediately began following him. So this is the point I want to make. The primary means for influencing someone into following Jesus is Jesus himself. It's not up to our efforts. It's not up to, you know, the latest trends or church growth technique, but it's simply the beauty of Jesus himself. So now I want to, now that we've kind of talked about the who and the what, Now I want to jump into the how, the how of discipleship. Because as we'll see, there's some quite, there's some really interesting patterns going on here that if if we look at this passage a bit closely, we'll see um, how they can speak to us as well. After the two disciples started following Jesus, he turned around and asked them, what do you want? It seems like here that Jesus is kind of checking their motives. Right? They could be following him for a number of reasons. Because while many people followed Jesus because they wanted to learn from him, many others also followed him because they saw him as, as a threat. A threat to their place in the religious system, as a threat to the way that things worked, and they thought that he might bring some change that was uncomfortable to them. So after Jesus asked them this, their response to his question is, where are you staying? And for whatever reason, this must have convinced uh, Jesus that their intentions were harmless and they wanted to learn from him. So Jesus' reply for them is to come and you will see. So obviously I think that this phrase, come and see, is important here, hence why I've given it the title of this message. So let's consider what exactly is happening here when Jesus says, come and see. I want us to notice that when Jesus says this, that the disciples were already intrigued by him. It wasn't their first interaction, and Jesus immediately says to come and see. Which brings us to the first point that I want us to talk about uh, in the how of discipleship, is that discipleship is relational. Let me give uh, an illustration of what I mean when I say it's relational. So, when I was in high school, I, there was a, well, there was a few, but there was one guy I'm thinking of whose name was also Derek. So, we weren't really friends, but we were friendly acquaintances, and we ended up going to the same university together. 
And we kind of had this, this thing when we would pass each other in the hallways. We wouldn't necessarily talk to each other, but as we passed by each other, we would each nod and we'd say, Derek. And that was the extent of our friendship. Um, so in university, I was a part of this uh, Bible study group. And at one point when we were uh, doing our study, I saw Derek walk by. So we we did our tried and true, and we looked at each other, nodded, and said, Derek, and then he continued to walk by. So the people uh, in the Bible study group, they were like, well, you seem to know this guy. Why don't you invite him to Bible study? And it was, in, to my understanding, it was you know, kind of the duty for Christians to be bold and, and invite people in. So very nervously and awkwardly, I, I got up, and I, I ran down the hall after him, and I I don't think I'd said anything else to him in my life, but I said, would you like to come and join us at Bible study? That was the last time Derek and I ever spoke. (laughs) He gave me a bit of a cold shoulder from there on out. So the question I've been asking myself is, is why did this happen? And I think it's because that when we invite someone into discipleship without prioritizing their relationship, then our invitation is hollow. I'm not saying that I shouldn't have invited Derek to Bible study whatsoever, because following Jesus often requires us to do things that are challenging and make us feel uncomfortable. But what I am saying is that perhaps it might have played out differently if I had put more effort into the relational component. Have you ever been to a, like a chain retail store where a worker approaches you kind of quickly as soon as you enter the doors with a smile on their face. They ask you how you're doing today and perhaps make a comment about the weather and then they proceed to get you to try to sign up for a particular product or something that they're marketing. Right? They understand that the best way to get you to sign up for something is, is by relationship. It's a lot harder for us to say no, at least I know it is for me, it's a lot harder to say no once the relationship is there. You feel awkward and you feel obligated to sign up for whatever it is that they're trying to get you to. Now, I'm not saying, again, that we're you know, telemarketers or that we're these kind of professional business people trying to sell Jesus to people, but what we need to remember is that we're not, we're not here to build our church and I have lower C the C is lowercase and underscore because we are trying to build the church, but our ultimate goal is not to build Bedford Baptist Church. It's to help God grow his church and his kingdom. Right? We're inviting people into a relationship with the living God and inviting them to be a part of his kingdom that he's building here on earth. So that's why it's important for us to do our work in a relational approach. The next thing that I want us to see about the how of discipleship is how it is transparent. Religion is understood as, you know, a set of beliefs in a higher power or in a certain god, or goddesses or gods, and in turn how we live our lives accordingly. But Christianity is, is so much more than this. Yes, there are beliefs that are central to our faith, but it's not just what what we believe and what we think. You know, as I'm thinking about, as I was reflecting on on Wally's solo that he gave for us, uh, there's much more happening here than just what we think intellectually and what we understand and the answers that we have for life's questions. But it's, it's what we do and how we live with our faith, even when we don't have the answers, that shapes how we live. It's far too common, especially in our Western world, that we limit our faith to to that, to questions and answers and how we can rationalize our faith in our minds. But again, it goes much deeper than this. Again, I I feel like maybe my, my illustrations go back to my university days, but just one more uh, as I think back to my days uh, at Mount St. Vincent, when I first 
I'll, I'll go back a bit further, actually. When I first came to faith uh, mid-high school, I was brought into a context, you know, in a great, and I appreciate a lot of it, but I was brought into a context that said, you know, now that you are part of this Christian faith, you have to, you have to neglect these teachings of, of science and whatnot, and you have to, you know, try really hard to uh, ignore what they have to say. So when I began university and professors started uh, telling me things that were contrary to what I had been told I, I had to go by, then it, it shook my faith, and I didn't know how to navigate that. And it took, me a, it took me a few good weeks, if not months, to really ask hard questions about my faith and, and what, what was it, and more important, who was it that I actually hung my hat on? You know, what, what was it that I, I believed to my core and, and what were those things that weren't as important? Jesus' method of sharing his faith with unbelievers isn't by explaining away what he believed to be correct. Right in this, the, the instance of this passage, what he says to his disciples is, come and see. And then it says that they spent the rest of their day with him. We often think that in order to um, persuade people to Jesus, we have to have all our theology sorted out, and we have to have our lives in perfect order. But this, this isn't true. There are actually studies that tell us that when people go to visit someone else's home, they feel more comfortable if the house isn't perfectly tidy. Now, again, I know I'm the youth pastor, and there's this reputation that youth pastors say things. So, what I'm, again, what I'm not saying is that there's no need to clean your houses, but what I am saying is, is that you shouldn't have this, we shouldn't have this kind of compulsive idea that if we're having guests over, a house needs to be perfectly tidy. We shouldn't feel pressure to have our house in perfect order before having guests over. And more than that, it tells us that we don't have to have our lives in perfect order. We don't have to have all our theology sorted out and our beliefs understood and, you know, just living in this perfect way. Because people, people aren't drawn to perfection. People are drawn to authenticity. One of the best ways to witness Jesus to people is by letting him in on our lives, by letting people in on our lives. Letting them into a life that at times it can be chaotic, it can be messy, but a life that is authentic and that is being transformed by the work and the person of Jesus. Come and see, not listen and let me instruct you and, and rationalize why I believe what I believe, but then at the same time living a life contrary to what you say you believe. Transparency is key to discipleship. And the last thing that I want us to see from this passage in terms of looking at how discipleship is done, is that discipleship is immersive. We talked about how to come and see Jesus is relational. We talked about how it's transparent. It invites us to follow Jesus, not just with what we think and believe intellectually, but it's about how we live our lives. And this passage also shows us that discipleship is immersive. When we invite people to come and see the ways of Jesus, we're also inviting them to be immersed into his life and into his teachings. The disciples didn't just sit and listen to the words of Jesus. Consider what happens in this passage and the aftermath of those who decided to follow him. First, Jesus re reveals himself to John that we talked about. And then John reveals Jesus to two others and then they reveal him to even more, and then more and more and more, and then next thing we know, following Jesus becomes this life-changing movement. I think our weekly gathering to hear from the Word of God together is important. There's a lot we can 
learn together, don't get me wrong, but our calling isn't just to come to church once a week for an hour a week, hear a sermon, sing some songs, and then we've done our job. Our calling is to be disciples and to make disciples in our day-to-day lives. How much more effective would it be rather than trying to convince people to come to our building, experience Jesus through the teaching and the songs, if instead that we were to be the church and we were to bring Jesus to our work, our homes, and our school places. Discipleship is, it's a, it's a continuous event. If you're a disciple, you make disciples who in turn make disciples, make more disciples, etc. So, in conclusion, let me just say this. That remember that we like John the Baptist, as we do this, we are proclaiming the Lamb of God. We are proclaiming the one who has come to not just set Israel free from oppression, but he came to set all those who trust in him, to set them free and to give them new life. And this is what separates Jesus from any other religion. Religion gives us a set of rules and beliefs that We must obey, and if we obey them, then we will be accepted by God. But Jesus, on the other hand, recognized that we, that people, just aren't capable on our own of obeying the rules. So he came to provide another way for us, a way that forgives us of all our wrongdoing and invites us to follow him in all that we have, all that we do, and all that we are, and gives us a life with meaning, purpose, and hope. Let me pray, and then I'll invite Leanne uh, to lead us in closing hymn number 446, King of my life, I crown thee. So Lord, we thank you that you are the ultimate um, example of how to do discipleship. And not that you are just an example, but you made the way yourself. So Lord, I pray that as we go about our days, that we remember who it is that we are inviting people to know what it is we're doing and that as we invite others to come and see, that they'll in turn also invite others to come and see. God, we ask that you be with us and lead us and guide us and continue to show us your love and your goodness as we leave from here and as we go about our day-to-day lives. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
thank you everyone for joining us this morning and trust and pray that God will be with you as you go. Thank you and have a good week.